This is Catalina Island, and it just happens to be right smack dab in the middle of one of the world's great biodiversity hotspots. It has all the challenges, ecologically, that we think of islands having, but instead of dwindling, life here is thriving. In fact, this place serves as a refuge for life. Does that sound too good to be true? Join me on today's expedition as we journey beyond Avalon on an island that seems like it came right out of a natural history fairy tale. It's hard to believe that only one short ferry ride away, about 23 miles from Long Beach, California, the heart of LA, is a place that's as unique and different as Catalina Island. My associate producer, Katie Mixon, has already been on the island. She's been scouting locations with representatives from the Catalina Island Conservancy. We meet and begin our journey across this enchanted island. As soon as you step off the ferry here on Catalina, you enter the charming town of Avalon. And the neat part about this place to me is that it tends to sort of replicate a lot of the patterns we see in nature on islands. When you think about islands, a lot of times you think about there's a limit. They have a finite amount of space, finite amount of resources. So if you visit Avalon expecting to, to go on a vacation here and get everything you need for your vacation, <laughs> it ain't gonna happen here because the stores are smaller. There's less space, less resources, less choice. Each island's unique, and this one's unique in so many ways. So many ways. As soon as you get off the ferry, you can see, visually see that uniqueness by even the mode of transportation, how people get around in Avalon we have to actually take golf carts. People are driving around in golf carts, yeah. they're walking, they're taking bikes, and that's because there is less resources, less space for people to move around and less choices, which is what you find in animal populations as well. That's right, and even the visitors. This place receives over a million visitors a year. It's just a little ways from the second largest population center in the United States. And it's almost like what we see in nature with migratory songbirds and waterfowl. <laughs> you know, a million people come here and what they're doing when they're here, they're consuming resources, they're, right. they're bringing things into the island, they're changing things just by simply being here. And that's just what we see in nature. It is, and this town is charming. It's eclectic with all the different people in the shops and the really cool walkways. I feel like I'm in a different decade. It's just a beautiful yeah. town, but as charming and as fun as Avalon is, there's a lot to see in the interior. Yeah. I've already seen some You've of seen it. it. I have it, and I want to go see <laughs> and it. And I can't wait to explore it with you. So Patricia from the Conservancy is waiting for us. All right, let's let's go check it out. The mission of the Catalina Island Conservancy is to be a responsible steward of its lands through a balance of conservation, education, and recreation. Founded in 1972 as a nonprofit organization, the Catalina Island Conservancy is one of the oldest private land trusts in Southern California. It protects 88% of Catalina Island, including more than 62 miles of unspoiled beaches and secluded coves. The Conservancy is a leader in conservation programs to protect and restore endangered species and threatened habitats. Avalon is quite a bit different than your typical California town, but even when you leave the village of Avalon and enter the back country, this land that the, the Catalina Island Conservancy manages, this 42,000 acre wilderness area, it's also different, different from anything else. You don't have to be a plant ecologist. When Katie and I first walked out here, both of us being familiar with that coastal sage scrub back on the mainland, we we're kind of struck by how different this place is. There's lots of plants and animals here that you don't find anywhere else. So this habitat I'm standing in, this is called soft chaparral or coastal sage scrub. And a lot of the plants that are here are the same plants that we find right over there on the mainland, only 23 miles away in these coastal habitats. We have black sage, we have white sage, and here and there we have California sagebrush. But when you look at the actual aspect of this place, there's all of these light whitish colored shrubs with these beautiful purple flowers. That's not anything you see anywhere else on earth. And here it's one of the aspect dominants. This is Yerba Santa. Now, Yerba Santa is a group of plants that you do find in coastal sage scrub, but this plant, Trask's Yerba Santa, is confined just to the Channel Islands, in fact, just this island. 
and it's not alone. When we look around this habitat, you see bush mallows, you see cacti, much more cacti than we see in coastal sage scrub over on the mainland. And it's much more open and easier to walk through than those that you see over on the mainland. There's a manzanita here, Catalina manzanita, almost like a regular manzanita with that nice shiny reddish bark. But when you look at the stem, completely covered with hairs, and this is the only place on earth you can see it. Even this incredibly showy yellow flower here, this is a poppy relative, but it gets to be tree size. We have tree poppies on the mainland, we have a special tree poppy here. This one, island tree poppy. It's found only here on Catalina and on one other channel island. So tons of Catalina Island endemics, tons of channel island endemics, and it's just enough that when you walk out here, it's different. It's naturally different. Catalina, it's quirky, and I love it. To really begin to understand the real nature of Catalina, you have to understand something about its origins. Catalina is what we call a true oceanic island. That means it's always been separated from the continent. It's not part of the continental landmass. And despite the fact that we're only 23 miles from the mainland here, separated by a little narrow channel, it's never been connected. So for the last five million years, that's about the age we think Catalina is, this island's been sitting here. And when it rose up out of the ocean, it was already isolated. So basically with an oceanic island, you're starting with a blank slate. And that's super important in trying to understand what's here and why it's so unique. And you see, the first step towards really becoming an island endemic is getting here. So how do you colonize a true oceanic island, one that starts out as a blank slate? How do things get here? You have to cross a pretty broad swath of water. There's a couple ways you can do that. One of the most obvious is with wings. If you can fly, you're much more likely to end up in a place like this. And so what gets here has to be able to cross that channel. And so of course, seabirds and shorebirds get here all the time. And they're no different than their cousins that we see attached to the mainland because they come and go as they please. But when you look at songbirds, some of the songbirds that we've been watching all around us today are pretty surprising. This chaparral and sage scrub is completely full of western tanagers. We've been watching them all morning. And some of these birds that get here that are really terrestrial birds have actually become a little bit different because they like Catalina so well that they stayed around and they're not readily colonized over and over again by migratory populations. So things like the orange crowned warblers and the bewicks wrens here are their own unique population, separate from what we see on the mainland. Insects, great example of something that comes over via wings, but also wind. Insects sometimes will just get carried across that 23 mile channel because wind currents will pick up things that even aren't great flyers and carry them up into the upper air currents and get them across that channel. That happens with plants too. Think about the dandelions in your backyard. Well, there's lots of relatives of dandelions here on the island. The giant Coreopsis, the silver lace, those species have winged seeds that use the air currents to get around. And so some of the plants no doubt got here because of wind. But the really unique ones, the ones that are difficult to think about, like squirrels, how did they get here? They got here by way of water. They floated. All along the coast of California, there's large beds of kelp. The dead and dislodged kelp float, and those animals that are likely to be along the side of the shore might catch a ride over here. I happen to be messing around in these little piles of kelp and found this little lizard. And something like this may colonize the island repeatedly, maybe a couple times a century. It'll ride a piece of kelp or rack over across that channel and hit the island. Something a little larger, like a squirrel, We'll need a larger bundle to ride across the channel. It's much less likely to happen. Matter of fact, it's like winning the sweepstakes if you get here. And that's what we call that type of colonization. We actually call it sweepstakes immigration because the pregnant squirrel that landed here landed on an island that had no competition. It won the sweepstakes, but the odds of getting across that channel were so low that it doesn't happen very often. It may have only happened one time in the history of this island in the last five million years. The thing about five million years is something that's even unlikely to happen, eventually it will happen. Just today, we've seen a caracara, the first record for that bird in the Channel Islands. It happened to appear here during our visit. 
But that just illustrates that point that given enough time, even tiny odds are overcome and something like a Caracara will end up on Catalina Island. And in a geologic time scale, when you start talking about five million years, that's how these species, like little lizards and squirrels, get their start on an island that's detached from the coast. And that, that's the beginning of all the incredible endemism that we see on Catalina. So for roughly five million years, Catalina Island has been here above the ocean. And all during that time, it's been colonized repeatedly by plants and animals that managed to beat the odds and managed to get to this little isolated piece of land. But what happens when they get here? Well, this beautiful tree behind me, Catalina Island Ironwood, tells a lot of that story. This incredible tree is in the Rose family and is a member of the genus Lyonothamnus. And the neat thing about this is it's the only living member of the genus. There's only one species today. This genus, this group of plants, was once found throughout the southwestern United States. All the other species have gone extinct. And the last one, the only one remaining, is this, restricted to the Channel Islands. There's two distinct forms that this plant grows in. And this form, with these simple leaves, is found only on Catalina. The leaves don't have any divisions to them. And as you move north in the Channel Islands, you'll find that those from the northern Channel Islands have leaves that are divided almost like a fern. This tree produces huge panicles of white flowers, and they look a lot like elderberry flowers. Even though it doesn't look much like a rose, that's the group it's part of. And it's very distinctive, not only because of the simple leaves and the large, showy groups of white flowers, but also the bark, which is highly shredding in these long strips. Sometimes we think about subspecies as being species that are on their way to becoming distinct species themselves. And that's because of the isolation the small population sizes, and the pressures that are put on those populations. The interesting thing about islands is that chance is everything. Managing to get here is the first stage. But then if you have a small population and all of the plants that colonize the island happen to have undivided leaves, you'll never have divided leaves. You're stuck with just those few genes that are in what we call a founder population, that's called a founder effect, that cause all of your descendants to share that trait. So chance plays a huge role, but chance also with islands can be very detrimental because you see islands tend to have high immigration rates. They also tend to have high extinction rates. Luckily, these Channel Islands were here to receive Lyonothamnus and allow us to enjoy it today. Somehow, this place has managed to provide just the right habitat to allow these trees to survive here amongst the sheltering hills and canyons of Catalina. So what happens if you actually do win the sweepstakes? You manage to get to Catalina Island. Well, when you get here, a lot of times there's no competition. If you're a small animal, and you're an herbivore or an omnivore, something that eats vegetation like squirrels, then you're absolutely free from competition and in a lot of cases, predators. So small things that get to islands, things like squirrels, a lot of times undergo something we call gigantism, meaning they get larger. And you don't have to think hard about this to think of some good examples. Things like the Globigus tortoise. And here on Catalina, gigantism has happened with these endemic squirrels. These squirrels from Catalina are much larger than the squirrels of the same species that we find on the mainland. And there's another giant here too, the Catalina Island California quail. It's about 10% larger than the quail that we find on the mainland. So when you get to an island and there's a lot of vacant space and there's little competition, those that are larger may have a better chance at survival and a better chance at reproduction. And think about it, the bigger guy, gets better territory, and he's able to garner more females. So what happens if you're a predator and you make it to this island? Well, the thing about islands is that there's an opposite trend. Predators in a space that's limited will have a problem if there's not enough food resources. And on islands, being a predator means a lot of times you get smaller. <laughs> well, 
I gotta say I owe Katie one this morning because she was walking along here along Silver Canyon and she says, I think I see a rattlesnake. Patrick, Patrick, come back. I've wanted to see this since we got to the island. I've been looking nonstop for a Southern Pacific rattlesnake. And Katie was lucky enough to see one when she was here with Colin earlier in the spring, taking some video. Yeah. Another specialty of Catalina Island. And you know, a lot of people are scared of rattlesnakes. A lot of people think they'll chase you down. They don't, but this one is really cryptic, Katie. It, it, it's built to match the environment. So it was really hard to spot. And, I, and he did that perfectly. The way he yeah. was coiled up and staying really still right in front of a rock was blending in, camouflaging completely. And that's why they're built to look this way is to protect themselves and to help them find their prey. Yeah, and he's a little older than you would think from his size. I mean, he shed seven, eight, maybe nine times, which lends me to believe that he's probably several years old. And this snake, um, again, is unique to Catalina Island. Even though Southern Pacific rattlesnakes are found throughout Southern California, it's one of the more common species. Recently, researchers here have found that their venom is a bit different and their behavior is really different. Notice he's not rattling and he rattled a little bit when I was <laughs> stirring him up, but he was striking way more than he was rattling. And that's a behavioral difference between this rattlesnake and a Southern Pacific rattlesnake on the mainland. Maybe that has to do with there being less predators out here on the island and that habit of rattling to warn may not be as necessary out here. An incredible animal and I just love seeing rattlesnakes, they're beautiful. And to think that maybe we have a new subspecies, a subspecies that hasn't been recognized before of this beautiful Southern Pacific rattlesnake here on Catalina sort of shows you that there's still a lot to be found. There's still a lot to be learned on Catalina and just a little respect when you're walking through the shrubs, the bushes is probably a good idea when you're here on Catalina Island. They won't hurt you unless you're trying to hurt them. So often, the part that's left out of this story is the boots on the ground, conservation part of actually applying research. So I'm really lucky to be able to talk to Tyler Dvorak, who is one of those people who are out here day in, day out, working on so many projects. And your primary project right now, we, we've talked a lot about this the terrestrial uh, issues here on Catalina, but you're working on this sort of interface between something that breeds and something that uses the water, right? So your main project is working with merlets. It is. I have a great love for birds and interest in ornithology, and this merlet project kind of just fell in our laps to actually look at a species that was little known on Catalina. We didn't know for sure whether they even nested or bred here on the island. Mm -hmm. um, the leading researchers in the field had a good idea that they were through on the water surveys of nighttime congregations that there are birds here during the breeding season right. around Catalina. So we end up joining forces with the California Institute of Environmental Studies. We ended up then through that project finding the first ever nests that were known from the main island of Catalina. And uh, that was great news. And that's just the start of things. Explain to us how are they nesting? Because I think a lot of people are shocked by merlets and, and what they yeah. do. Yeah, the, the merlets are crevice nesters mm -hmm. and they utilize concealed nest sites that are in cliff walls and back in sea caves. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll be at the base of some steep cliffs, a lot of time there are scree piles, just right. piles, piles of, of rubble yeah. and rock, uh -huh. large boulders, sometimes the size of, of you or I. But way back in under <clears throat> this jumble of boulders, there's crevices and holes that the light can't get in there and mm -hmm. other predators can't you know, really find their way in there. And then you have to try to get your arm in there with a flashlight <laughs> or get a mirror back in there for a and look for an eggshell fragment or a hatched eggshell or when you're lucky, actually a bird incubating mm -hmm. or maybe a chick with one of its parents. And we have set up transects that are actually able to be replicated on the water at night where we spotlight for birds and we count them along these transects at certain times during the year and over multiple years to try to get an idea on trends in the population. Then once we do that, hopefully we'll be gaining more and more nest sites to monitor that we find, and we can start looking at trends in the overall population of birds congregating at the island along with the success of the birds right. nesting, and look at things like what are the limiting factors for this species here on Catalina. You know, for this 
species, a place like Catalina, it may not be ideal habitat for them, but it's very important for such a small, isolated species that only has possibly at the most eight or nine breeding islands anywhere in the world that it breeds on. And with some of its main islands where the majority of the, the world population um, living for this short breeding season, you have things like oil spills and, and other disasters that could really affect a great proportion of the species in the world, but just at a very small place. Right. Um, so every very small little place that this bird is nesting is really important. Man is not a new immigrant to this island. Katie takes me to see a site that demonstrates this poignantly. So we're right below the airport, yep. and the place I wanted to take you to is right over here. I think uh, I can see it. Yep, yep. Patrick, I brought you here because I found something really cool that I wanted yeah. to show you. When I was in Catalina back in April and exploring the island, I found this rock quarry, and it illustrates what you're always telling me about mm -hmm. how people's choices make impacts, and this impact yeah. It's written in stone, <laughs> exactly. yeah. You can see it written in stone here. This is a soapstone quarry. Yeah. And what's really neat here is we can see, just locked in time, the way that people thousands of years ago, we're talking at least 2,500 years ago, and probably longer 7, than 7,000 years ago, they think, they were quarrying here on this island. And they would take and scrape away a soapstone bull by creating the outside of the bull chucking it off of that mm -hmm. uh, by just, just scraping around and creating the bull and then breaking it off and then hollowing it out on the inside. I wonder how long that process took. A while, yeah, <laughs> a while. <laughs> but the reason soapstone is so important is that soapstone could be used to cook. So you can actually put soapstone with a high talc content, and, mm -hmm. and that's what's in the rock here on Catalina that makes it so valuable is it has lots of talc in it. And so you could put that soapstone with high talc content right into a fire or under heat and use it to bake and to cook in, and it doesn't pop, it doesn't shatter, it doesn't explode. Right. Uh, when the temperature changes, it allows it to actually absorb and change with the heat without breaking. So an uh, extremely valuable yeah, innovation. I mean, I've heard it compared to a, a microwave of the early times. It could change what their, what their diet was. They could get higher nutrition from the right. foods that they were eating. Right. And I, I hear that they shared it with other people, not just on Catalina. They right. could actually export this soapstone that yeah, they and, made. And they've actually found soapstone that they think came from Catalina as far away as the Colorado River in northern Arizona, Four Corners region. What an impact <laughs> that a, a small amount of people can make on an, a small island here off the coast of California all yeah. the way back on the mainland. Yeah, it's so cool to see. We're not going to get any closer than this but <laughs> because it's an archaeological site and we, we do want to respect that. But you know, I, I always try to remind people as often as possible that um, human beings have been having an impact, our choices, for a long time. You have to remember, people have been here in the Channel Islands for nine to 12,000 years and their choices in the past have impacted significantly and not necessarily negatively, right. but significantly the natural world that we see all around us. To really understand just how important humans have been in the past and how important human choice was and how important your choices are today, you don't have to look any farther than the local oak trees here on the island. This incredible, huge, beautiful oak is McDonald Oak. And it's a Channel Island endemic. It's only found here in these islands, but this one's history is pretty interesting and it's totally dependent on the previous actions of mankind. You see, this oak produces a pretty decent sized acorn. Matter of fact, the acorn's kind of in between the size of the local endemic, the little scrubby species here that we call island scrub oak, and another species that's found on the islands, but also on the mainland, a larger oak with huge acorns that's called valley oak. It turns out that this incredible plant is the product of the meeting of valley oak and island scrub oak. And it's only because valley oak was introduced to this island by humans that these two things ever came into contact. See, valley oak produces enormous acorns. And even though we today don't consider acorns to be part of the all-American diet, Native Americans were heavily dependent on acorns as a stable carbohydrate source. 
They made flour out of them. They ground them up. They roasted them. They did all kinds of things with them. They, they were a, a plentiful and abundant food resource, similar to what we'd use wheat for or corn for today. Well, because Native Americans introduced valley oaks here to these islands, possibly thousands of years ago, these oaks came into contact with the local scrub oak, and they produced hybrids that have a pretty extensive large acorn. And if you compare the leaves, if you compare the fruit, virtually any part of this tree, you'll see that it's exactly intermediate, exactly between what we see in the scrub oak and the valley oak. And that's this one, the McDonald oak. So even these incredibly gorgeous, large shade casting oaks, the McDonald oak, that are found only in the Channel Islands are the product of the choice that human beings made so long ago. People have been a part of Catalina for thousands of years, shaping the environment, changing, adding, and subtracting from the diversity. From foxes to oaks to the strange and seemingly out of place bison that roam Catalina today, the hand of man is visible everywhere you look. Join us next time as we continue to explore the relationship between man and the unique life of Catalina. Every island is unique. The same characteristics that lead to the special and often bizarre life that develops on islands also makes them incredibly fragile and easily unraveled by man. We've seen the story over and over again, from Hawaii's loss of native birds and plants to the decline and struggle to save life on the incredible Galapagos. But there may be a place where man and island can coexist to the benefit of all. Catalina, the jewel of the Pacific. Is it possible to preserve the unique life on islands and accommodate people too? People have been a part of Catalina for thousands of years, shaping the environment, changing, adding, and subtracting from the diversity. The mission of the Catalina Island Conservancy, which manages around 88% of the land here, is to be a responsible steward of its land through a balance of conservation, education, and recreation. The impact these managers and researchers are having on the island appears to be making a profound impact on the health of the island specialists. To begin our look at man's influence here, we meet up with John Mack, the Chief of Conservation for the Catalina Island Conservancy. So this is a really interesting spot, Patrick, right here, um, oh, where we wow. see all these uh, shell flecks wow. on the soil surface. So this was a, a, what's called a midden site of the, the native peoples that were living here for millennia. And this is basically the, sort of their garbage dump. And there was house sites right up here. So they were right, sort of throwing, right. like, sort of like we might do, they were yeah. just sort of throwing stuff over the side of the hill here. And this is built up in this, you know, probably have a meter or more. <laughs> yeah, it, well, easily a meter here. And I don't even think we were close to the bottom of this midden. It's just what has eroded away along the path here. Yeah, and so you see all these fragments of abalone shell. Oh, yeah. This was a main protein base of their economy. But then they would supplement this with a lot of plant material and vegetable matter from the upland areas. Sure. The other thing is they use this a lot. So I happen to have a, a just a smaller shell here of a, this is actually a small abalone. Yeah. But they had this amazing culture where they would drill holes and they would use it for jewelry, but more importantly, they would make fish hooks out of this, these J-shaped fish hooks that they would carve out of these using the um, patterning of the shell. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's so cool. So you look at the, the height of this midden is incredible, but also it's the fact that, I mean, this is basically all we have uh, for knowing that there were people here. And, and you, you threw out a number that was like, how many people in this little stretch of well, coastline right here? I mean, it's hard to pin it down, but the, some of the archeologists that I deal with think upwards of a thousand people were in this sort of mile from that ridge there, yep. maybe a mile this way on all these flat top ridges. And they love this area. And as you know, on Catalina, there's not a lot of flat ground. That's right. And so almost all these flat ridges would have had houses on them and pretty, a lot of activity going on um, as they sort of manage this landscape. And that's, we sort of have used that term 
over in the past year or so, what they call the lived landscape of Catalina. Right, Because right. we are still embracing people in this landscape today, and there's 4,000 people that live on the island year round, and there was, we think, upwards of that many for 10,000 years even. So Yeah, so we're talking somewhere between nine and 12,000 years or maybe more of habitation. Yeah, I think our oldest island. dates are about eight here, but we think that was longer. Yeah. And so, um, they were managing this landscape to produce foods, acorns and bulb plants, toyon berries and the Catalina cherry groves. They were managing those to have reliable production that was sustainable right. and healthy and was there year after year. Just then similarly, they were extracting the marine resources out with this really sophisticated maritime culture. Yeah. They were in a lot of ways working with all the natural processes right. and harvesting things when they came into fruit and then moving to the next thing after that and not you're saying I need this like 12 months out of the year, you yeah. know, kind of kind of a, a way of approaching it. And these were people that were really tied to the sea. Especially here and the coastal tribes, there was a really extensive trading culture here. So Catalina was the premier soapstone deposit of North America. Right. And they were quarrying soapstone, shipping blanks and finished material across to the mainland and probably trading for things they didn't have like deer skins. Right, and it's kind of that idea that these people were living, that you and I always talk about, I know, is this idea of man being here and nature being there, when in fact, they're one and the same. Exactly. And it's just a myth that we're separated um, in, in any way, shape, yeah. or form. And our choices matter, and they last a long time. The impact of people has perhaps even led to the arrival of some of the now endemic species. I spent the late afternoon sitting patiently and quietly along a fence line near biologist Julie King's house, waiting for what she promised would come my way. And just before I gave up, there they were. What I just saw here was not one, not two, but three endemic island fox. And this animal has an incredible story of recovery, but it's also one of the most interesting biologically here. You see, the Catalina Island fox is much smaller than the common gray fox, which we think was the ancestral species to this peculiar little and very trusting fox that's found here on this island. It isn't just a predator. It's omnivorous, eating both meat and fruit, but it's the most herbivorous of all foxes. It spends a lot of its time eating fruits and nuts and digging around in the leaf litter, looking for things that have fallen from the trees, but it even can climb trees. It has partially retractable claws, just like a gray fox, and can go way up a tree after berries, fruits, nuts, food resources that other animals couldn't get to. And that's important here on an island where there's not a tremendous number of prey items for a predator. What's most interesting to me, though, about this incredibly tiny fox is how we think it got here. You see, people and foxes arrived just about the same time throughout the Channel Islands. And this tiny little fox may have been a semi-pet to the people who settled these islands. And their transport of those animals onto this island may be where the island fox we see today came from. It's a valid species today. It's endemic to these islands. It's incredibly endangered, but it has a great future here on Catalina. So Julie, not only does this fox have just such a spectacular story of how it got to the island maybe, and you know, the, the, the biology behind it, but it also has this incredible story of recovery. So could you tell us a little bit about what happened to the foxes here and then the process of bringing this incredible species back? Um, in 1999, um, there were approximately 1,400 foxes on the island. And at some point during that year, canine distemper virus was introduced into the island. And within less than a year's time, over 95% of the population had contracted the disease and had perished. So we were down to less than 100 foxes in under a year's time. So they were going through a critical crash. And in response to that, the Conservancy contracted with the Institute for Wildlife Studies to do an initial survey to see what foxes were remaining on the island and how we could go about recovering them. We were very fortunate that the shape of the island goes to a very narrow isthmus there at yeah. the town of at Two Harbors. Two Harbors, yeah. So the West End population remained intact. 
we almost had two separate islands. And so we brought in healthy animals from that West End population that were, were still very healthy and active. So we put those in captivity to start breeding them. We had a vaccination program, which involves vaccinating both those captives and then any animal that's out in the wild and also a translocation program. So the young of the year from the West End, we started moving over to the East End to fill in those gaps. And the result of all this work is that in just a few short years, 99 wasn't that long ago. No, it wasn't. How many foxes are on the island today? Now the estimate is just over 1,800. And that's incredible. That <laughs> is an amazingly fast recovery program. We don't just don't hear about recovery stories like this very often, especially when we're dealing with a predator. Uh, right. You know, these carnivore recoveries are usually painfully slow. Their primary threat hasn't gone away, and that's disease introduction. In this case, it was a stowaway raccoon right. that climbed onto someone's boat unexpectedly and swam ashore and it was sick. So since we can't always control what comes to the island, we can at least control what's on the island. Right. So we continue to vaccinate and, and monitor, and we'll probably have to do that in perpetuity. Wow, I'm really shocked at what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah, not exactly what you expect to see on an <laughs> island off the coast of California. Bison, it's not a native California mammal, but it's hard enough for a squirrel or a fox to get to this island. Imagine a bison. I mean, How did they get here, right? They had to have a little help, right? And you probably already know. I, right? I happen to have studied and, and found out, you know, the real story about how the bison got here, but... Yeah. What in the world would a huge animal like that, what kind of impact could they have on right. this island? And that's something to think about. The challenges that face animals, even the size of squirrels and foxes, when you have a limited amount of space. And 42,000 acres is a lot of space, but it still limits on that. And so you have to think about how many bison this island can support and have healthy, but also the health of the ecosystem. And they've done it here in such a thoughtful way. I'm just amazed and impressed by the project they have going on here. So I'm gonna send you to talk to Calvin Duncan and, and I think you'll be impressed too, to find out just how much of an impact they're having here on this island, really setting a model not just other islands should be using, but land managers that work on populations like this around the world. One of the biggest surprises in Catalina is the bison. What are bison doing here on an island off the coast of Los Angeles? Well, I'm here talking to Calvin, who is a wildlife biologist with the Conservancy. So Calvin, where in the world did these bison come from? Uh, well, Catalina has a great Hollywood or film-based production history. Uh, and in 19, or 1924, 14 bison were introduced to the island specifically to support a backdrop for film production. To be in a movie. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, as far as I know, they didn't really end up on film, uh, but they've remained behind and Catalina is a huge tourist destination and when you have something this novel on the island, it draws attention. So even before the Conservancy was here, the bison had become really ingrained with the culture of the island and have been a huge part of that tourism draw. Bison are not native here. So what kind of effect does this essentially non-native animal have on an island? Anytime you have a non-native animal in an area, um, they can obviously change the ecology of the island, especially something this large. Bison, by biology, they tend to maintain grasslands, so okay. they will keep other plants, shrubs and stuff kind of taking over. So that's not something we necessarily want on the island. They do help us manage some of our non-native grasses, but ideally we want to have only a small group of bison on the island and keeping just the grasslands we have. By 1986, one of the surveys that we had done had the population upwards of near 600. A research project that the Conservancy commissioned back in 2001, 2003, we were specifically looking at the ecology of bison on the island and how many we could sustain. At the end of that study, uh, we determined that approximately 150 could be maintained without having uh, severe adverse uh, issues or impacts on our native vegetation and allowing for enough habitat to remain for our native species. So how many bison do you have on the island today? Uh, currently we have approximately 138. We've had extreme success using a contraceptive a vaccine called porcine zona pellucida. We initiated the process in late 2009, early 2010, and through the contraceptive we've actually been able to reduce the population and now we're actually backing off on our application of the vaccine and allow the population to continue producing calves. What sort of operation is it to give a contraceptive to such a large animal, how does that work? Uh, well, PZP specifically requires uh, two small doses of the vaccine delivered to the females only. The beauty of this is we don't actually have to capture the animals or hold them, we can deliver the vaccine remotely. And how we do that, uh, we'll track them down and we use uh, actually just a dart rifle and a small uh, vaccine dart. So the vaccine can be delivered in a very small dose. This is the whole dart right here. So one milliliter of the vaccine, we load it into a CO2 powered dart gun 
and we generally get between 35 and 40 yards uh, administer the vaccine, the dart falls out, we pick it up and we just record which individual is, is given the, the vaccine. The island ends up being a really great place. We've kind of coined it the living laboratory. So anything that's out here, it's in a kind of a controlled atmosphere being on an island. We can approach things very scientifically and within a controlled environment that allow us to do research and study that's going to be applicable elsewhere. And anywhere that's planning on using this particular approach, we're going to have a lot of the answers that they're going to need to determine that this is something that they want to use. So bison were introduced to Catalina by people, and people have made them a part of their home and a part of their culture, and now people's choices are keeping them here and healthy. And that's something we can see all over the island. Those species that are now living here on the island that displace natives, brought here intentionally or unintentionally by man, have greatly altered the natural functioning of this island. Here on Catalina, there's a plan in place to reverse the harmful impacts of these species. All right, Patrick. One of the biggest problems we face here and then California and in a broader context, the whole world really, is uh, invasive plants. So here you can see one of the invasive plants we have on the island, harding grass. Yeah. And this is an area <laughs> where it's been allowed to kind of become a monoculture was planted here for forage, actually, for cattle when they did cattle ranching out here. And so we're kind of living with the legacy of that right now. Oftentimes quoted as being the second largest threat to biodiversity on the exactly, planet exactly. are things growing where they're not supposed to grow. So mm -hmm. invasive exotic for those people who don't know. And exotic means it's not local. Right. It's something that came from elsewhere. And mm -hmm. invasive refers to the fact that it actually can displace yep. local plants and really alter local communities and the dynamics of them. Exactly. When they get here, they don't have those uh, forces that would hold them in check, such as uh, predators or diseases. So they're able to just take advantage of that, and uh, you can kind of see the results of that <laughs> yeah. here. So, a lot of people would look at this and say, too late, write it off, this area is not worth saving. Mm -hmm. You guys are taking a different approach. Yeah, we've uh, put quite a bit of work into this species, so if you uh, come with me, we can see some areas that we've uh, worked on it and made some progress. Excellent. Lead on. All right. So you can see here, this is one of our areas that's been a heavier infestation of harding grass or Phalaris aquatica. You can see we've done a lot of treatment on this for about four or five years and yeah. then done some this year. Yeah. And then, good kill. <laughs> yeah, right in here we've gotten some good kill. Yeah. But in an area that is uh, as invaded as this, we've found that we need to give Mother Nature a little boost. And so we do that by turning to our native plant nursery and doing some active out plantings. And it's pretty obvious on the landscape, you know, the stuff you got planted up because they're all armored with these <laughs> little tubes here. Exactly, yeah. And so inside the tube, it looks like a golden lotus. Can I take this off? Sure, yeah. yeah. So the oh. tubes are there to protect the plants and it's been horribly dry the past yeah, couple years in, in this part of California. But one of the tubes there is for protecting the plant, right? Right. So uh, this tube here is because we have a couple species of introduced browsers here. We have mule deer and then also the bison. This golden lotus, which is a channel island endemic, also looks fresh and green. And I guess that's because you're smaller tube here. We have the smaller tube to help channel uh, water down into the root system, either when we water or any rain, try yeah. to help get that down as far as we can. I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing to see something working. So often when we look at a problem with infestation, there's species that are real problems. Mm -hmm. But we look at them and we say, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. The problem's too large. And you guys are doing something, and not just on a small scale. Your coverage is 42,000 acres. Yeah, out of the whole island, we work on 89% of it. It's a big task. And but... you've already achieved some eradication of some species here. Yeah, we have. We've achieved a few eradications. Yellow star thistle that's been eradicated for quite a while now, and then Cape Ivy. And then we're coming very close with a few species, such as tamarisk or yeah. salt cedar, which yeah. is a big problem. Also, we're doing quite well on pampas grass and fig trees, kind of mm -hmm. more in the back country. Yeah. For somebody like me that's been involved in this kind of thing, I've, I've just got to ask you, because to have a successful program like you mm -hmm. do, what does it take to have something succeed at this size? Yeah, it takes a lot of work. So right now we're two full-time employees. We have four interns right now and a lot of volunteers. A serious commitment. It is a serious commitment. The uh, rewards to it are not always obvious, but... But it's one that pays off. It is one that pays off. Uh, I'm blown away. I've rarely encountered anything of this scale, and especially something that's sustainable, and where you have the commitment to go through the future. It's mm -hmm. incredible. To be able to do this type of restoration, you have to have the native stock to restore it. And this is perhaps the most challenging part, 
of the entire project. This is incredible. It's like every native endemic on the island is here. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really neat to see so many of these things. And the, the purpose of this incredible nursery, I mean, what, what, why is this needed? This is an example of one of our rarest shrubs, or sometimes it's called a tree. This is the Catalina mahogany. Yeah. And it's an example of a rare species, an endangered uh, yeah. species. When we're talking rare, we're talking very rare, but like seven known individuals. That's and... right, yeah. Last that we've recorded, there were six or seven uh, pure individuals. And at the turn of the century, it was recorded, there were, I think, about 400 plants at one point. And now they're coming back. Species like this will go as outplantings into other restoration sites where they have kind of a hedge against extinction if something was to happen to the wild population. Other plants have a lot of ornamental characteristics. Catalina silver lace or Constancia nivinii yeah. is endemic just to three of the southern Channel Islands. So Catalina, uh, Santa Barbara, and San Clemente Islands. Yeah. And th there's a beautiful example of this, Navalon, and it's growing on a cliffside with I didn't see anything else native. It was like yeah. just this issue of all of these invasives and exotics that have been brought to places like Avalon for so many years. Mm -hmm. So you have a project going there too, don't you, in town? In Avalon, we do uh, native landscaping and uh, we try and encourage island stakeholders to use our Catalina native plants. One, they're drought tolerant. They have a lot of relationships with pollinators and wildlife on the island and they also can be beautiful and functional in your garden. So it's a small community, but um, that's one of our outreach efforts. So some of these plants are going out to restoration areas. You're trying to put back these incredibly rare, cool endemics. Yeah. How successful has this been taking plants generated here? It varies widely depending on the species. All these plants have different strategies for dealing with the drought that we have here in the Mediterranean climate in California. And depending on the species, some will do really well, planted as a container plant, others very unsuccessful, would be better planted as seed. It's an emerging science and within Southern California, there's the growing need for restoration in these really endangered habitats and also a increasing understanding of how they function as systems. You really have to kind of mimic what nature would do to recover these landscapes. We rely on a lot of volunteers and we have various conservation corps. The American Conservation Experience is one we work closely with and AmeriCorps and then also a troop of kind of local volunteers that we work closely with and keep us going. In addition to our living collections here and plants that will be planted out for restoration, we also have a seed conservation facility, a seed bank. And in that uh, seed conservation facility, we have uh, about half of the native flora is represented there. We've been collecting seeds. That's awesome. For, yeah, we're 20 I'd, years. I'd love to take a look at it. Okay. It was something we're trying to do. Too. Yeah, let's go. So our seed conservation program is focused on seed collection and conservation of two plant groups. One is rare plant species, and then the other is bulk collection for restoration. Here in our seed facility, we have over 20 years of collections representing 243 native plant species from Catalina Island. And the last count we did with our database, we had about 240 million seeds in conservation here in this facility. So you, you really have two layers of backup here for plants. You've got your living plants, and then you have this long-term storage. Yeah, that's right. Not all of the diversity on the island is endemic. Some are emblematic and wide-ranging with a long history here, but that's often a history of loss. Some of the most charismatic are well on their way back. While I'm visiting restoration sites, Katie is spending time with Peter Sharp and some of the eagles of Catalina. We are in our eagle aviary. It's where we keep our educational bald eagle, Pimu, and golden eagle, Heidi, and also where we bring birds temporarily, <laughs> such as Currently, you've got one. K-28 up there who was pulled from the ocean a few days ago. So I see the bright orange tag. What do you use that for? Each bird gets a unique number, and that allows us and others to identify the birds from a distance. By the late 1950s, early 1960s, all the bald eagles were gone from the Channel Islands. Tell us why that happened. The bald eagles were wiped out primarily because of DDT pollution. There was a manufacturing plant on the mainland, and thousands of tons of DDT were dumped into the ocean. And what that does to the eagles, it impacts how the females lay down the eggshell. And basically the eggs would break before the chicks could hatch. So starting in the late 40s, we probably had no reproduction. And with no young, the adults just died out and there were no more eagles on the Channel Islands. The organization I work for, Institute for Wildlife Studies, was created initially for the bald eagle restoration. Our initial restoration work was here on Catalina. 
we brought 33 young bald eagles down here between 1980 and 1986 and put them in large, what we call hacking towers. They're about an eight by eight foot cage, 15 to 20 feet up in the air on, on stilts. Wow. And so we get eight week old birds, bring them down, put them in these towers for a month, feed them through chutes so they can't see us. And then when they're ready to fly at about 12 weeks of age, we open a front door. They're free to go out on the front stoop there, get some more exercise until they get the courage to fly. Each breeding season, which is essentially January through June, July, I have employees that are monitoring the eagles, finding out when they lay their eggs, if the chicks hatch. Were you so, going in and checking the eggs to see if they were still had DDT in them, if, if they were harder than they were before? Um, initially on Catalina, the first eggs all broke in the nest. So what we started doing is we got artificial eggs. And as soon as they would lay, we would go into the nest, we'd take the fragile, real eggs, place these artificial eggs in there, and the adults would just come back and incubate those. <laughs> we would take the real eggs for artificial incubation, uh, mostly at the San Francisco Zoo. Okay. And then when the chicks hatched, we'd bring them back down, take the fake eggs out, put the chicks put in. Put them back with their parents. <laughs> and from that point, the adults would just raise the chicks on their own. And in 2006, two birds, which were actually from Catalina, but breeding on Santa Cruz, successfully hatched a chick for the first time in 50 years or so. Wow. You went from absolutely no eagles to, you feel it's a solid population now in Catalina? Catalina, yes, we, we have eight breeding pairs here, which is probably about what it was historically before they were wiped out. Having them breeding on their own, it's a relief for me, and it's really a testament to the work that we've been able to do here and to maintain the population to the point where they could start hatching their own eggs. A lot of people come to Catalina because they think it's a place where they can see California the way it was. Whether it's the charm of Avalon, or the hills that are not developed, or the crystal clear water around the island, it harkens back to a simpler, less complicated time. What I love about Catalina, and what the Conservancy stands for, is that it represents what California and the world can be how we can work together to reverse damage that we've done, to welcome people onto the land, to give them meaningful, fun, exciting experiences with nature, provide lovely amenities, which the town of Avalon does, how you can live in a small footprint community, which Avalon is, a smart community, and how we can even make that better. So it has all in one place, a major university, a major conservation organization, a community that is open and receptive to people, and how you bring those together to model what our state and our nation can be is what to me is so very exciting about Catalina. The lessons that can be learned here are poignant and lasting. Human choice is important. Your choices are important. This place is a shining example of what dedication and investment in the natural world can do. For now, it seems that Catalina will remain California's jewel of the Pacific. I'm Patrick McMillan, wishing you your own exciting expedition.